Coming up on your favorite podcast, the PGA Preview Pod is back. Ty back with me again this week after a week off with dad duties. We talk a little bit about the previous Memorial Tournament, which is got all kinds of interesting stuff to talk about with there. Patrick Cantley wins the tournament, but that's really not the story. The story is John Rahm. The story is Bryson DeChambeau. It's Brooks Kepka. We also talk a little bit of the U.S. Women's Open, which honestly, to be perfectly honest, between the two, I watched way more women's golf than I did uh, male golf this week. Uh, the U.S. Women's Open was was fantastic. I enjoyed every second of it. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll look ahead to this week's event, the Palmetto Championship at Congaree. It replaces the RBC Canadian Open for this year. Fascinated to see it because we haven't seen Congaree on TV really before. But the golf course is phenomenal looking. I can't wait to see it uh, in a television setting. I'll definitely be into that this weekend. Plus, Ty and I get into some other stuff. I got to talk about my golf game with him. I'm in. I'm in the weeds a little bit, so I need his. I need his guidance. We'll do that next. It's Ty. It's me. It's the pod, and it's now. Hey, it's the Tim Anderson podcast, PGA Preview Pod, back on again. I'm Tim. That's my buddy Ty over there. Tyus, how are you? Doing well, Tim. Thanks for having me on this beautiful Tuesday night in God's country. That's what we'll call it. It's something. I don't know if you want to call it God's country, but it's uh it's something. I mean it's here. It's uh well let's just call it what it is, Ty. It's hot as hell. Right? It's hot as hell. It's been hot as hell up here for a week. Uh, it's 99 in my car. It was 99 in my car when I got in it today. Um, we saw 103 on Saturday. It's only early June here. What's going on, Ty? Well, Tim, you gotta, you gotta plan those escapes. Uh, the humidity is low, so you take the good with the bad. And I was up at the lake this past weekend, um, for a fishing trip and I don't think it ever got over 85. So like I said, you you just got to plan it a little bit and, and stay off the golf course Get on the lake. That's what these days are made for. The lake? That's what I did. Aw, oh, come on, man. We don't do the lake here. We're golf. It's golf family over here. It's a golf thing. I did golf in the heat. Um, Saturday, honestly, it was weird because Saturday was the hotter of the two days last weekend, and I actually was like the most comfortable on that day. The Sunday is what took it out of me. We played Sunday morning, and it was like 89, 90, 91 when we teed off. But for some reason, I was more tired at the end of that one. And I don't know if it was like the residual effect of just like playing the day before and whatever. But for some reason, I don't know, like the heat on the Saturday, I think it was because I was totally ready for it. We had the cooler. We had plenty of water. And I don't know. It didn't bother me like Sunday did. Yeah, there's something to that. It's certainly, there's a little bit of a sun hangover. I mean, think of those days that you, you know, it's 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. and you're ready to go to bed because the sun takes it out of you. So, yeah, I'm sure. Just think what these, I mean, it kind of a segue. Just think what these PGA Tour guys have to do a lot of times on these Florida swings where they might be playing four days in a row in the sun. I mean, these guys have, have to have incredible endurance to play golf like this. And I think that that may be a big difference between a, a good golfer on a fair weather day and one round versus a guy who can string it together for four days. So Yeah, I talk about that. I talk about that a lot with like when people were talking about Tiger and his back, like, can he come back? I'm like, listen, this isn't just about walking four days on a golf course because you got to walk the, mon- the the practice rounds. You got to walk the pro-ams. I mean, you, these guys are playing 18 to 27 practice holes. You know, they're playing 27 practice holes, maybe even 36 practice holes a week before they even tee off on Thursday. You figure like that's a – you know, if every golf course is like a seven, eight mile walk for these pros, that's, you know, that's 36 miles or so, 32 to 36 miles during the weekend. And then another, you know, another 12 to 15, 20 miles in the practice week, 60 miles a week or so, these guys just walk. And I'll tell you this, I wasn't going anywhere near walking a golf course this weekend. It was all cart all the time. That's pretty much my motto. If I'm not in a cart, I'm not playing golf. You're not a walker anymore. You don't walk at all. You don't want to walk. Sometimes walking's okay. I like walking, but it's got to be morning. I like morning, and I like uh, cooler conditions. If you give me like 65, I'll walk all day. But if you get it up over 75, 80, 
that's been becomes a little more difficult. Yeah, I'll walk in the right conditions and. Uh, there is something to be said about walking to your golf ball and just kind of being in your own head and not having the chatterbox sitting next to you, um, you know, and the beer sitting in front of you. But, you know, I certainly do play better when I walk, but yeah, I tend to like to, to ride to me. That's golf, the social part of it and just relaxing. Uh, I'm a little bit different of a golfer than you. I don't, I don't play as much for sport. I play more um, to get away from, from, other things. I guess that's fair. And I got out a lot last summer to walk, mainly because early on with COVID, we had to walk. Uh, but I actually ended up just kind of liking walking on certain courses. I mean, there are a lot of courses where I'm just like, that's not a fun walk and I don't want to do it. Like if it's a long walk to the tee boxes, uh, you know, like we go out and we play the ponds a little few miles north of here. You go play that red course within the residential, and like those are long walks to tees. I like short walks to tees. I like old school golf courses that are fairly flat to walk. That's nice. Those are good walks. I can do that. Yeah, I'm with you. That, that's something that that may be an acquired taste for me. As a spectator, like when I walked the 3M, I enjoyed that walk. That's an okay walk when I was at the 3M a couple years ago and we followed around Matsuyama. Like I didn't feel tired walking that. That felt like a good walk as a spectator. But when we did Aaron Hills for the U.S. Open, it was hot and that was not a fun walk. I'm, I'm dreading my trip to Sand Valley where it's no carts. You have to walk it. I mean, and it's like a nine-mile walk at Sand Valley. Yeah, that's the difference between the 3M Open and the U.S. Open. They picked those courses that, uh, yeah, would not be fun to walk uh, and that much less enjoyable to play, I suppose. I'm a little nervous about that. Like They always say, like, oh, you'll love Aaron Hills, you'll love Sand Valley. I don't know. I hope so because it's a long walk. I really hope I like it. Um, it is, But it's been hot up here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, it has, you know, we've seen triple digits here. Uh, you're right. Not a lot of humidity yet, but, but pretty hot, a pretty oppressive heat. Uh, and it's going to hang around here for a few more days. And then it drips back to the, the low nineties, high eighties, which much more gettable for guys like you and I, you and I are finally getting out and playing this weekend, Ty. I'm super pumped up about this. I know I'm not going to, I'm not going to let anything get in our way. I'm looking forward to it and and if you, you'll give me the opportunity here in a little bit, I'll give a little shout out to my buddies who we're going to be playing with because I think it'll be a fun foursome and that, that makes it all the more fun for me. Yep. You and I are, uh, we're going out and we're playing a little hole in the wall, uh, ramshackle, uh, golf course up in the North, uh, the North part of the Metro, uh, that course may not even be there a year from now because they're talking about, you know, building houses and eminent domain, but on a Saturday morning, let me just tell you, ain't nobody there and you can get out there and play and it's just wide open and I have always enjoyed that part of the golf course it's like the quiet it's not advertised much like they don't advertise the course a ton uh it's a place that you can sneak in sneak out it's cheap it's the cheapest course in the area so you and I are going to go out and play in the farm fields on Sunday on Saturday sounds good I'll I'll take a a hole in the wall course if I can get done in three hours and 15 minutes um I'll, I'll I'll tell you the story of when I called and booked the tea time. I got Cindy. Uh, Cindy said, when would you like to play on Saturday? I said, 8 o'clock. And she said, okay, we'll see you at 8. There was there was no uh, pushing any, anything around. Uh, anytime I wanted, we could tee off. I think she might have just set the time. Yep, she pretty much did. Uh, she, uh, I have met Cindy, uh, and uh, it is, it's basically, yeah, I have never had – an issue getting on the golf course. Let's just put it that way. They have never once said to me, God, can't get you out today. You know, and I'm a member at a golf course and they have a hard time looking at me going, Tim, sorry, there's just days I ain't got nothing for you, pal. Like that's insane, but never there. I can call them up yeah. two out like an hour before. And I go, Hey, is there room? Oh yeah. Come on out. Yeah. <laughs> Something to be said for that, especially in COVID times, post-COVID times, because in the last year and a half, getting a tea time in this place has been pretty darn difficult. Yeah. yeah I'm excited to try the track. You you keep pumping it up, putting the pressure on me, telling me that I better shred it, otherwise I'm a hack. So I don't think I've I quite guess I have said to have like my that. game on Saturday. Yeah, I haven't quite said it like that, but I will say this. Given your prestigious, your prodigious length, your prodigious length and your immense talent. If you've got it working, I think you can shoot. You can break seventy-two. 
I, th- I, I really believe it. If you've got it working. Now, if you don't have it working and you're hooking the ball all over the yard, you're going to have trouble. Uh, and, and you won't score. But that's anywhere, right? But if you've got it dialed in a little bit, I think you will shoot. You can shoot. You can break 70. I really believe that out here because of just length is such an advantage. There's a couple drivable par fours. The par fives are long. Like t- the tenth hole, I think is five seventy. I mean, it there. I can't get. I need three full pokes with like a driver, a hybrid, and a six iron to get there in three. You can do it with a driver and a three wood and maybe a little pitch, and you can get you. You can make birdie. I, that's a huge advantage. I can't even talk about it. Certainly, we'll 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 chalk up the expectations for round number two. I got I got to get the lay of the land a little bit. You know, I'll probably uh, take a breakfast ball and and dink around a little bit. But you know, it, it should be fun. I'm looking forward to playing a new track. And if if what you're saying is correct, then I, I might just like the place. I mean, I, I will say a course that doesn't get a whole lot of credit in this area that I like just because it it suits my eye. Um, there's just not a lot of trouble to find for me is Greenhaven. I mean, yeah. I, there's a lot of holes that I can just, it's like, there'd be no reason not to take driver because even if I'm over on the fairway to the right, it doesn't really matter. Right. I can just hit a little eight iron over the trees onto the green. Yeah. I, so that those are, those tend to be the types of courses that I like. And I struggle a little bit there. That's a tough, tra- that's a tough golf course for me. And maybe it's a little better now, but it, I've always had, I've always struggled there. Um, I definitely want to get back there with you. Uh, cause they've done some nice work with that course. The 18th is very different than it used to be. I, I would love to try that one again with you. What I like about these kind of courses that are off the beaten path and maybe not the world's greatest is that I think they like that you're there number one. And I think I like this course cause I hit all 14 clubs. I feel like I hit every club in the bag. And so if nothing else, it's like a good workout for your game. You just get to hit shots and it's kind of fun to do that. And you're right. We will play in three hours, 15 minutes. It's a guarantee. Sign me up. Never. Pl- I've never played a round longer than 315 there. Let's just say that. On Memorial Day, that Monday, I went out with John and I played in 245. That's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. Separate uh, note, no free ads, but uh, have you seen the the strapped episode in Peoria where – where Neil gets all worked up about the biker gang behind him. (laughs) I did see that. that. They were so mad about these guys hitting it up their ass. And I wonder if that's like, do people think that about me because I'm such a pace guy? You know, I like pace. I don't know. I just enjoy pace. Now, I guess I understand like, yeah, but you're with dudes. Don't you want to have a good time? It's like, well, yeah, I do. I just don't want to have a good time for five hours. Like, that's not a good time. Yeah, I hear you. But the out with with the no laying up guys is they, they did ask these guys to pass and they declined. So then you're kind of on your own at that point. I agree point. with that. I, I agree with that. Uh, if you if you get asked to play through and you don't, then you need to stay. Then you need to hang back and you need to kill more time because you did it to yourself. You had a chance to get yeah. through. I have no sympathy for those folks. But let me say this to you. Is there anything more – It's I'm getting better at it because I'm playing through a lot of people now. But playing through a group is a little nerve-wracking, isn't it? I mean, is that your is that your least favorite thing in the world to do? Yeah, and it, it, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if it's a couple sticks or a couple hacks or a couple of women who don't know anything about golf. You're still a little bit nervous. Yeah, I don't like it. It's I'm getting better at it because I'm learning that like, you know, I'm better than these guys. There's a reason I'm playing through. So I'm not going <laughs> to I don't worry about judgment not even a little bit. Not even a little bit of worry am I of judge of judgment from these clowns. So I just go there and stripe one, put on a little show sometimes. Uh and uh, but I used to be really nervous about it and I know friends of mine who we'd play and they're like, "God, I just don't like it cuz I feel rushed." I'm like, "Why rush? They're pl- they're letting us play through." Now, yeah, yeah, don't dawdle. Don't take your sweet-ass time, but don't change your routine just because you're playing through. You know, play your yeah. shot. It's a necessary part of golf. It makes everybody's – the reason that, that a pass happens is because someone wants to get through and someone wants to fall behind and not have someone up their ass. So it's a necessary part of golf. You just got to get used to it. But, yeah, it's a little nerve-wracking. But, you know, 
speaking about you, I mean, the average person that you're going to be golfing or passing is going to think whatever you do is a good shot and they're going to think you're a good golfer. So you just kind of have to put it in perspective a little bit. You could hit what you're, you know, disappointed in and they're going to think, holy buckets, this guy's good. Yeah. So. Uh, and I, I, the only thing I, nothing drives me nuttier. And that's the thing you, you say, what's the, what's the two evils here? The guy who lets you play through, but now you got to put on a show in front of him, or the, uh, the old guys. And they're mostly old guys that do this. They just refuse to let you play through. Refuse yeah. under any circumstances. Yeah. They take it as some sort of slight against their manhood. Yeah. Uh, they, I don't know what it is, but it's mostly old people. Young guys tend to get out of your way. Some, sometimes they don't, but it's I chalk that up to sometimes they don't know the etiquette. But most of the time, they get out of your way and they let you play through. Old guys, it's 50-50 if they're going to let you through or not because they just – they get, and I've heard it from people like, "I'm not playing any faster." They, I paid to be here, and I'm gonna play at the speed I want to play it at, and blah blah blah. That's great, and that's the thing. I'm not telling you to play faster. I'm telling you to get the hell out of my way. I'm telling you to <laughs> shake your ass or get out of the way. Yeah, you're right. I know the exact person you're talking about. Oh no my clue. god, it's infuriating to play behind. Pe- I'm getting better at it because I told myself this year I wasn't gonna get angry about pace of play. But I've had this conversation with so many people who are like, you know, I'm a little deliberate, and I don't think that's a crime. It's not a crime. But if there's a faster guy behind you, get out of the way. This is not complicated. It's not a Rubik's Cube. I don't understand. So if you didn't pick up on this, Tim and I are playing golf on Saturday at 8 a.m. If anyone wants to come out and follow the group, it's going to be a a spectacle. Um, We're going to do a little two-man best ball, a little money on the line. We'll see exactly how the scoring is going to work, but um, we will report back next week. I'm looking forward to that. That's always, it's always more fun to talk post round than it is pre round because what do you talk about? Cause you don't know how, how you're going to play or what the conditions are going to be. So um, stay tuned for that. Would you like to talk a little bit Olympic club, U S women's open golf? Yes, let's do that. Uh, I want to talk a little, uh, uh, cause I got to say, um, you know, I've, I'm in on the LPGA product. I really am. I think there's good parity this year. A lot of different people are winning. You're not seeing, like, it's not like one of those years where, you know, like uh, Jin Young Ko a couple years ago went on a run and won, like, five times or when Lydia Ko was at the height of her powers uh, or in B Park. I mean, it's a it's really a plethora of people who can win every single week on tour. And last week, a major championship, a U.S. Women's Open, I was in. I love the commercial free, uh, the Rolex. That I I was in a hundred percent. I watched way more LPGA than I did PGA last week. Yeah, good on Rolex to invest. I'm sure the the amount of money that it took to make that happen uh, makes it makes it a lot more watchable. I love the Olympic Club, and I think it's really impressive that a 19 year old went out and won it. Maybe the hardest golf course in the world with with what you're getting from a setup standpoint, because it's, it's different. The, the, the women's U S open is different than a men's U S open in the, in the fact that the men's U S open, they're going to stretch out and stimp up the greens, right? The women, they have a little bit more latitude and, and the course might play at 65, 6,800 yards. And that's totally fine. And it's just a different, it's a different mentality. And they were able to make this course really hard for these women. And this, I mean, it all really showed in the in the the back nine down the stretch and the finishing scores. Again, super impressive. We'll talk about is it Yuka Sasso? Yuka Sasso, yeah, who's got a we'll talk about got her. a beautiful golf swing. It's uh, she it's, uh, it's picturesque. Have you ever watched Royer McIlroy swing the club? Yeah, it's 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 identical. Same She's, swing. It's the same swing. Same exact swing. And I thought Sung Hyun Park, who was really falling off a cliff here, had the prettiest swing in golf a couple years ago, but. I mean, Yuka has got power, and that's one thing. I think Chambly pointed this out, that like the U.S. Women's Open is really a young woman's game. And you start to look at the leaderboard, and you're like, well, that kind of makes sense because you have Yuka Sasso. You had that uh, Mega Ghana, uh, who for 17 years old was fantastic. I mean, I was in on her the entire weekend. I thought she was terrific. Um, and, and Lexi was there, obviously. Who's not really? I mean, she's young still. It's hard to believe that like she's been playing on the pro tour for like fifteen years uh, or twelve years. This or something was her fifteenth like U.S. Open. Yeah, she's been playing since she was like thirteen years old. She, and she's twenty six. Yeah, it's incredible. 
Uh, we'll get into her in a second, but like, it's you. You have to have some stuff at the U.S. with the way they grew that rough. Like, you could instantly be like, "All right, Lydia Ko is not winning this because she doesn't hit it far enough." NB Park, I, I give you NB credit. Like, the reason why NB was there is because she puts the hell out of it because she doesn't hit it very far either. Uh, but the girls who hit it far, they're in it. Like, they got a chance, and that was clearly what it was. It was, uh, you know, Jatanagarn was in the mix for a long time there, who hits it a ton. I love Arya because she doesn't hit a driver. Like that that woman is th- is irons and three woods because she does not hit a driver and she doesn't have to because she's long. Like she can hit it for days with a two iron. It's uh, it's yeah. pretty fun to watch that. But I love the 18th hole. This ribbon That's fairway, cool. super tiny yep. fairway with thick, thick rough. I mean that ball disappeared yep. as soon as it hit the rough. Yep. Super cool, super fun, challenging hole. Lexi Thompson's back nine on Sunday was utterly baffling. I just cannot wrap my head around it, other than the fact that the weaknesses of Lexi Thompson that I've seen for years were back. She's not she's not a great putter, and her putting looked atrocious on yeah. the back nine Sunday. And she's just not a not a great iron player. Just not. Like she's a bomb and gouger. And if she's bombing the hell out of it and can gouge wedges from the fairway, she's good. But if she's gotta actually be like strategic and hit shots. That's not, I don't think she's got that. I don't think she has that kind of finesse in her game. And I know people look at her golf swing and are like, man, that golf swing's fun. I mean, I don't know how you can be successful with the impact position that she has. Like, I, I just, no. the way she's kind of falling away from it and standing up yep. on her leg, she generates great power with it. But I don't yep. know how you can consistently hit the ball where you want to every time. Yeah, it's definitely a... a- a swing that requires perfect timing to connect. And, and before I talk too much about Lexi Thompson, I just want to give a shout out to the golf course. I love the Olympic club. It was beautiful. Uh, Before the PGA championship last year, I had to hear comparisons between TPC Harding park and Olympic club only because they're in close proximity. That's to me, that's like comparing the ponds and Hazeltine. It's just not close. I I love Harding Park. That's not fair. Harding Park's a beautiful golf course. I'm not a big fan of Harding Park. I think that that the Olympic Club is just superior in every single way. It's such a beautiful setup. It sets up like it sets up like a like a city course, almost like you're at Keller, except it's more spread out and the holes are beautiful. The conditions are immaculate. The the greens, I don't know. I, I just don't know enough about the history of Olympic Club and going back to know if the greens are typically faster than this, but they weren't playing super fast. So it's pretty impressive to have a course that plays that difficult. When it, it's a long course, but it's not a, a you know an, an obnoxiously long course, and the green speeds are are slightly above average. And to put on that kind of a test, I think is a huge testament to the course. Um, Lexi Thompson, if, if you watch the highlights, which I did a couple of times, the she putted very poorly. And I won't even say she putted poorly on the back. She was just so tentative. I mean, so it, she, tentative. very bulky. It wasn't good. She did have, I mean, it could have been a vastly different score on the back, even though she didn't play great. She struck the ball okay. I mean, it's not like she was 100% off. I mean, she seemed to have her game. She really had two bad breaks that obviously cost her the tournament. I mean, the the lie on 17, which she claimed was the worst lie she's ever had in her life or maybe ever seen, was pretty, you know, that. but that's that's the nature of the U.S. Open with the thick rough. But, I mean, she was basically able to hack it out 25, 30 yards, and on a par five, that's just not going to do it. And then on 18, again, a beautiful hole, like you said, her her iron shot in was almost good enough. I mean, that, with that pin in position, she really, I'm sure, was trying to just fly it over that front bunker. And that's a terrible break. And you maybe don't want to call it that, but you don't want to be in that front bunker. No. So, so that front pin position is really exactly where it should be to give that Sunday test. And they did it. And the difference was was how they played 18. That's the way it worked out. Um, uh, Yuka Sasso as everyone knows, had two double bogeys on two and three and could have easily as a 19 year old counted herself out. And she didn't, she took it hole by hole and she stuck in there and it was just good enough. So it was impressive. Um, Disappointing for Lexi Thompson, like you said, uh, not a young player, but a very experienced player. Um, And she, you know, kind of took it in stride a little bit and, and 
said the corporate line. She's got a lot of golf left to play, which is true. Um, but you know, else has a lot of golf left left to play is this 19 year old golfer that we're going to talk a little more about. See, this is the problem I think with Lexi is that I think her window is, it's not closed. It may not even be closing, but it's not wide open like it was a few years back. I mean, if you look around, I just think there are other players, including American players, that are just better than she is. Like, I would take both Corda sisters. I don't think Lexi's better than Brooke Henderson week in and week out. I don't think she's better than Lydia Ko week in and week out. She's not better than the Jutana Garns week in and week out. I mean, there's there are players that she's just, she's not better than right now. And she used to be hands down, far and away, the best American female golfer. And it's not hands down anymore. Like, it's not. They're, I mean, I think both Corda sisters are better. Uh, I, you know, you love Marina Alex and, and, uh, it's kind of what happened to Michelle Wee, right? Uh, where she just was like, we kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and her body let her down. And she did get the breakthrough U S open, which was awesome, but that's it. I mean, is we looked at Michelle Wee and you know, she was in our conscious just like Lexi Thompson was like from a young age, she was this phenom, this wonderkind. And we kept waiting for her to take American female golf to this new place. And she never really did. And Lexi's sort of in that same mold. And we're waiting for her. And I don't think she's going to do it either. So, like, when is that next great American female golfer? Is it Nellie Corda? Because if it is Nellie Corda, we're still waiting on that too. Like, she shows you flashes. But, like, here she made one bird, or she made a couple of birdies on the last round, but she missed the cut by 10 miles. So it's tough. Yeah. It's a tough spot for American golf right now. Yeah, there's uh, – on the on the girls' circuit, there's just a lot of good golfers outside of the U.S. And and if you look at the men's side, it could be a reason why, you know, maybe they're, they're struggling a little bit with ratings is – I mean, on the men's side, I think they would struggle a lot if – if there weren't good young American golfers, if there wasn't a Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, or Phil Mickelson flashing back, I, I mean, I think that the the ratings would struggle. So yeah, American golf has has its work cut out for it. They've got talent, but they need a breakthrough. It's interesting. They did the uh, Peacock did a nice job actually with some of the the feature group stuff, and I I think they overheard Nelly talking in her group and they were asking about like, Hey, why don't we do some sort of a Solheim cup thing with South Korea and the United States? And I think Nellie Corda is like, because I don't think we want to get our ass kicked all the time, you know, or something like that. And she's, she's not wrong. Like no. we, that would be a bludgeoning. Uh, the yeah. South Korean golfers are so far ahead, uh, with what yeah. they've got done. Uh, it was, it's really something to watch. So yeah, I agree. Great job by Yuka Sasso. Great job by Olympic club. And it makes me fired up for Tory Pines next week, which by the way, it's a two podcast week for you and I next week. We have to preview it and we got to sit here on Sunday night after it's all done and talk about it. U S open Tory Pines, more primetime California golf. Sounds good. I'll be here for both. Can't wait for that. That was so good. All right. We got to talk um got to talk memorial. I didn't watch it a ton, but obviously two big stories broke out of there. Let's start with the first big story and then we'll kind of continue from there. John Rahm has the six shot lead uh after Saturday. Uh test positive for COVID. Uh and they have a pretty I mean it, it's a pretty black and white protocol and it's one that they've had in place for 50 weeks. Uh it's what's been a, I think to the tour's credit they have been able to navigate these waters where like major league baseball had trouble. The NFL had challenges. The NHL's had challenges. The NBA had challenges outside the bubble. The PGA tour is a traveling circus that goes to a different city every week. You got a lot of people. Yes. You have some guys who fly private. That's true. Most of the guys on tour and most of the caddies do not fly private. They fly commercial, they're in airports, they get exposed to elements just like everybody else, and yet they've only had four in-tournament COVID-positive tests in 50 weeks. So I think before, I know ready, I know some folks are ready to rip the tour. I think the tour deserves a little credit here that they've been able to do this pretty steadily for over one calendar year. But this one is unfortunate because it's the first time it's reared its ugly head in this position. Yeah, you and I discussed this uh, over the throughout Sunday a little bit, and and we differ a little bit on views, but I agree with everything you said. I mean, rules are rules, and I, I guess 
my issue goes beyond golf and that's why, you know, I won't get into it because it's not a golf pot. It's, it's a golf podcast, but as far as if I was the, the commissioner of the PGA tour, if I was the rules official or the Memorial um, tournament director, I can't say I would have done it, anything any differently. So that's kind of where I stand on that. So I, I think they handled it as well as they could. Um, no one made a mistake and yeah, it, 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 it sucks for John Rahm. I, I, as, as much as I'm not a John Rahm guy, I feel for him um, because I do believe that these golfers are probably being very, you know, whether they're staying six feet apart, I, I don't know. I mean, I think they feel pretty comfortable that it's a little bit of a bubble, um, but I don't think they're at the clubs and I don't think they're rubbing elbows with, with every Tom, Dick and Harry throughout the week. So I do feel bad for any person who has to, you know, WD, especially with a six stroke lead when, when there's a million and a half on the line. So. Yeah. And I think the scenario here, I think people, you know, just looked at the result of like John Rom test positive and he had to withdraw. Oh, this is garbage. And it's like, well, let's trace this all the way back because uh, you got to unpack the whole thing to, I think, really kind of get to a place where you understand it. On Monday, they told him, hey, you, your contact tracing situation put you in close contact with somebody who's tested positive. You can withdraw now or you can be subject to our protocols where you got to go separate locker rooms, separate practice facilities. We got to get tested every day because there's a really good chance you might test positive here. Uh, he chose not to withdraw. He chose to play through it, and this happened. But it's not like he didn't know that this was coming. He'd already been in the protocols pretty heavily. And the word is that if you got the vaccine, uh, you're not as te- you're not tested. Like if you're fully vaccinated and you've gone through all the the stuff, the two weeks, whatever, you're not really not even tested anymore. So the only people that they test now are the unvaccinated, contact traced, whatever, and the protocols are kind of lax for those guys. And that's fair or unfair, right? We, it's, it, I, I think you can, we can argue this a million different ways, I think. Uh, you're right. Taking the politics out of it and just looking at the policy, it feels like a pretty black and white, cut and dry policy. And again, what I always say to people is this has happened three other times during the course of the last year, but it hasn't happened to the leader before the final round. But nobody said anything. Like if this was Troy Merritt, who we love, but Troy was tied for 50th. If Troy Merritt tested positive, does this become a story? Not at all. Nope. They, everybody would say, ah, oh, that's too bad for Troy, right? But then everybody would move on. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's the difference here. And, and that's where I want people to just be consistent because everybody just wants the rules to just be skirted when it's somebody they like or it's a leader of a tournament. And it's like, no, rules are rules. They're like, well, why can't he just go play by himself? Because that's not how it works. Like, that's not how it works. We're not just going to change rules and make accommodations because we want this guy to win the tournament. It, it sucks for Jet. It sucks for the tournament because I feel bad for Patrick Cantlay because he wins this tournament and everybody's talking about Rom and Cantlay played pretty well himself. But, you know, I, 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 it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a crap situation. It sucks for the tour. And I think actually the tour is a month away from stopping testing, period. Because I think they get to stop it in like July. I think they've talked about like July 7th or something like that being the time when they're like, all right, we're no longer testing. We're no longer doing protocols. Since everybody's back 100% capacity, we're just rolling with this. But we're still in it until then. And and rules are rules. I feel bad for Rom, but at the same time, this was 100% avoidable too. You could have not played. Yeah. And I think that this is classic example where things are tough to – to get out in a text message. So I think we're closer than, than it felt on Sunday as far as I was worried you and I were going to have to come to blows here on the pod again. tie. <laughs> no, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, nope, nope, not my personality, but, but I, I, you know, I was also in the moment and, and, you know, I, I feel strongly about a lot of things and, and, you know, COVID-19 is one of them. So, but uh, again, it all comes down to if I was the tournament director, would I have had a better option? And I wouldn't have. So that's all that matters. Absolutely. So, so Cantlay does win, which for you and I, we were so high on Cantlay at the beginning of the golf season. And then he kind of had this stretch where he's really struggled. Him winning the Memorial, does that reinvigorate your thoughts for him winning the U.S. Open? Because he was my pick. Remember, back in January or whatever, I said Cantlay is going to win the U.S. Open. I'm back on it. I'm in it. I, I'm I'm on that train. I still believe Cantlay wins the U.S. Open. Did this give you some hope? 
A little bit. I mean, it does discount it a lot. It shouldn't, being that somebody, you know, beat him by six strokes. But it, it certainly helps, right? Muirfield Village is a very respected golf course among the these professional golf circles. I mean, if you look at the po- the pre and the post for these guys, you know, a guy like Rory or, you know, people who you really trust, I mean, they really respect this golf course. So to come out and win against an A-plus field, of course, it, you always have to, to step back and respect that. And, you know, it, it, it sucks a little bit that, that there's all this chatter about Rom and that can't, like, can't bask in the glory of winning the Memorial Golf Tournament. But in the long run, it's going to be a win. It's a big win. People aren't going to remember the Rom thing in a year or, or even a few months. So, uh, yeah, I, I think he, he stands a, a great shot at Torrey Pines. Um, I don't know that I would pick him just because I, I remember when we thought he was, he was the best golfer in the world. He was the best thing since sliced bread. It's we've come a long way since then. Um, this win helps, but some of the past struggles still worry me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it kind of led me to a little bit of a, of a conclusion that, that we were a little more bullish on him than we should have been. Um, but, but yeah, he's, he's training in the right. Anytime you win a big tournament, you, you got to look at, that person as a contender. Yeah, take Rom out. He beat a great field. I mean, he stared down yeah. Morikawa in a playoff. Uh, he, you know, that's that's a legitimate. I think that's legitimate, right? Um, to to beat a guy like Morikawa in the playoffs. Spieth was in the top twenty, which, by the way, Spieth's top twenty might be a miracle. Uh, yeah. He shot. I mean, he looked about as bad as you could look on Thursday uh, or his first round. He shot seventy six. It was horrible. And then to come back out that afternoon and fire 67 and make the cut and then hang around and stay in the top 20, pretty gutsy stuff from Spieth because he could have folded the tent pretty early on that one. Yeah, Spieth is kind of all over the place. I shouldn't say all over the place because it's mostly been good. But when he's been good, I still have felt that he's been off a little bit. And that is a testament to just how good of a player he is when he is able to put it together and he's playing these, these courses that fit his eye. Um, it's, it's going to be, you know, look out for Jordan Spieth and, and just hope you're in second place and can collect a nice check because man, he's just such a good golfer. Um, I'm so glad he's back because he, the game needed him. And, Again, what he's done lately has just been so impressive, not necessarily because he's playing his best golf. I want to reiterate, it's because he's not playing his best golf and he's still in the mix every single week. Exactly. And that's just it. Gutting out a top 20 when you have nothing. I mean, this is not a great – this has not been a great course tra- uh, traditionally for Spieth. Uh, and he had nothing off the tee. I mean, he looked he looked lost with, uh, with his uh, – with his driver game and his iron game on Thursday. And for him to basically in 30 minutes flip it around and go shoot a bogey-free 67 is like, I mean, that's pretty gutsy stuff. I mean, like I said, if you're Jason Day, you're WDing and going home and, and making sure you make the next uh, go, you know corporate sponsor outing. Uh, but uh, not not Spieth, which I give him credit for. Uh, that, that's pretty gutsy stuff. Hey, uh <laughs> Speaking, another guy who took T18 was Bryson DeChambeau. The Brooks Bryson drama continues. Did you see this stuff this week? I did, and I, and I read about it today because I was. It's not even really prep for the pod. I'm I'm just interested in it, and and I'm going to stick with my original take, and that's the more Brooks does, the better Bryson looks, and and he's 100 percent right when it comes. He, Bryson keeps saying, I hope he keeps talking about me, right? It's great for the player impact fund. I mean, he's right. I I don't know about that, but as far as publicity and relevance, like Bryson seems to be taking the high road at every stop. Um, And it's been interesting to see a few players sort of come to Bryson's like speed a little bit and and have a little bit of, of empathy for both of them, but really kind of in a way take, um, Bryson's side and just say, yeah, it's got to be tough for him. I kind of know what he's going through, but you know, he's handled it like a professional. We'll see how long Brooks or Bryson can tolerate this, this hoopla or whatever you want to call it. But you know, he's done a good job so far, but Brooks Kepka is making it clear that he's not going to let any of this go, which is great for a golf fan because they're not going to be able to avoid each other over the next couple months. It's great for a golf fan watching TV. It's bad for golf because 
I don't want more people going to golf tournaments and trying to act like they're part of the action. I'm already sick of that with fans in the NBA and fans going to games thinking that they can just say and do whatever they want at these tournaments or at these at these basketball games, throwing bottles and popcorn and things like that. Like I want to be very clear. Like the Baba Booey guy and the guy who liked the, you know these guys, I don't want heckling during backswings of golf shots, and I do feel like we are moving dangerously close to that area where you know guys are showing up to actively root against golfers and say terrible things, and I I don't want that at the PGA Tour events. Like I don't want that. You're right, and I'm I, I 100% agree with you. I was more talking from a the average golf fan perspective because the average, because the average golf fan goes to zero events a year. I'm That's talking true. from a TV in the media perspective. Yes. When it comes to being at the tournament, the whole beer thing with Brooks Kepka is childish. Stupid. And I, I, Absolutely I, I don't, I don't know why a sponsor is even tying their name to that. Um, but it, yeah, that, that stuff is childish as far as when it comes to allowing the players to do their job before and during their swing, and even after their swing, something has to be done. And I, and I think Bryson, in a way, has kind of called for that. He's he stated that, you know, essentially stating, yeah, we'll see what the, the tour does about it, you know, because they're going to have to do something. Otherwise, he's going to do something about it is, is kind of what he's, he seemed to be insinuating. But, you know... I think golf is in a way just going to let this play out on its own. They're, they'll get control of the, of the fan stuff because that's the easy stuff, right? You can kick people out. You can warn people before, um, you know, I don't think it's a, a majority thing. Um, and I don't think that this is something that'll keep up a ton. I really don't. Um, but yeah, they, they really have to address the Brooks situation because Brooks can't be egging it on. That's, that's just not professional. Yeah. I thought it was just a bad look from Kepka, and, and you know, I'm, I've been on Kepka's side on this for a lot of it because the is really easy to root against. Um, but Kepka, it just felt wrong the whole way. It felt like, man, I'm like, it, this stuff is so beneath you. And especially when you come to hear like it's Kepka's camp that leaked the video of golf channel, the golf channel thing where he's rolling his eyes and stuff. And it's like, so what is Kepka's game here? Like he's trying to act like Joe Cool, like none of this bothers me, blah 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 blah. And yet here he is. I mean, basically throwing gasoline on this fire. And I don't under I I, I just don't think I think Brooks is trying to have it both ways, and that's that's the stuff where I can't get behind it. Like I said, you're either in it or you're not. But you can't act like, oh, uh, you know, I don't really, yeah. I'm not encouraging that behavior. I'm just saying, blah, blah, blah. Like, you can't piss and moan at the PGA Championship about all the fans surrounding you, which I 100% agreed with him on, but then turn around and encourage poor fan behavior to other golfers. Can't do it. Can't get behind it. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a mind game, too, because he's he put himself in a position where he can turn around and say, Oh, it was misconstrued, or that's not what I meant, and I'm sure that's what he's going to say. You know, that's that's the easy thing to do, but we we all know what he meant. Um, I trust that it'll be under control. And, and again, I just don't think enough people go to these tournaments and pay good money so that they can be kicked out in the name of Brooks Kepka. I just, if we were talking about Tiger, or Phil, or or someone of that stature, maybe, but I don't think that Brooks Kepka is is going to command that. So we'll, well, I hope it'll, it remains up. to be seen. I hope you know for the U.S. Open specifically. I hope that the the security's out there, and I hope that Bryson points to every one of them and throws them all out. Yep. Uh, like, I'm sorry that you blew your money to get into the U.S. Open just to be thrown out because that's what's going to happen. And I'm 100% in For support a case of, of beer. Yep, for a case of Michelob Ultra. Which for a $20 you know, what, case of beer. Which your wife wouldn't drink. No. Is your wife a beer a beer drinker? Yep, when she's not pregnant. And that boy, that's never. I mean, that's hardly ever. You guys are like jackrabbits. I mean, <laughs> my God. <laughs> uh -oh. That's all. There's a litter. You don't have kids. You have a litter. Uh, that's what's going on over there. But hey, the oldest boy, uh, the oldest is uh, is done with uh, first grade, right, or kindergarten? Kindergarten. So kindergarten. he's done on Thursday. This so was pretty exciting for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it is, and he's starting to get into sports. And but he's big into Godzilla versus Kong. So his he has a birthday and birthday party on Sunday, and it's Godzilla versus Kong. Theme. Oh boy! So there you go. More into that than sports, but good times. That's okay. I love it. He's battling. He's battling the heat at the schools right now. So. It's tough. Yeah, some of these elementary schools are really challenging right now. 
I know hell at the high school where I teach, I I went up to a couple of different rooms today where the sun was really beating in off the windows, and I was like, "What is happening? It's like a hundred degrees in here. This is terrible." So, uh, I'm I'm glad I teach seniors and they're gone because my there's nobody in my classroom, so there's no body heat. It's pretty chilly in there while I'm still finishing grades, so that's kind of nice. So, but I go. did stand in the heat last night and read all 575 graduate names last night at uh, at the football field. So. I got that done. Nice. Yeah. Hey, golf question for you. Let's uh, let's get back to us before we get into the picks this week cuz I have to ask. I need your guidance, Ty. I need your I need a second opinion. All right, so over the weekend I played two rounds of golf. I played I shot 81 and I shot 79. On the surface, you say to yourself, "Well, that's not terrible. It's not quite my it's not quite the standard of golf that I like to play." But you say to yourself, "That's not the end of the world, right?" Here's the thing. I drove it better this weekend than I have ever driven it. I mean, I hit 11 fairways Saturday. I hit 11 fairways Sunday. I drove it the best I ever drove it. I was sitting in fairways with nine irons and eight irons and pitching wedges. And I shot 81 and 79. My iron game was abysmal. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Abysmal. From the middle of the fairway, I'm missing it 15 yards to the right or to the left. Like I'm either pulling 15 or pushing, mostly pushing 15 yards, which if it's a big green, I'd end up on the green with a 100-foot putt or I'd be off the green and I got to chip it. And the grass was really thick at both courses around the greens and I was having a tough time stopping it. Very frustrating with the irons this weekend. I'm starting to wonder if I have these Hogan irons, which I like a lot. Like, this is not me saying I have inferior golf clubs. But I'm starting to think maybe these clubs, though, as much as they're pretty and they're beautiful and I like looking at them, are not for me. What do I do? Well, it's going to be difficult to to judge from afar. I'd have to see you play them. And and I think that that golf is really difficult to critique yourself. I think it's very difficult to critique yourself. I think you need a second opinion who has eyes on it to say, because there are times that I go out and man, it's like, man, I feel, I felt, I played really well and I scored really poorly or vice versa. I may have felt like I played very poorly and scored well. And that's, I think because of, of the perspective of you, you know, you may have felt you could drove the ball well because you hit 11 out of 10, you know, 11 versus 10 fairways or 11 versus nine or hit two more greens in, in retrospect, it's more about making the 14 foot putt that you didn't make yesterday. And I kind of figured this out a little bit when, when I went through the worst duck hook, really the only duck hook I've went through and knock on wood, because that would be a terrible thing to wish upon a person, but I went through a terrible duck hook and the crazy part was was my scores did not hardly dr- did not hardly inf- hardly inflate at all because the other parts of my game were better because they had to be better and I may have still been making the 14 foot putt you know two times around so I'll I'll report back to you after Saturday it'll be difficult I might have to play a couple rounds with you to know because you you may play better with your irons on Saturday than you played with me last time. Well, that was 45 rounds ago. Yeah. So you may not be playing as poorly with your irons as you think. Obviously the scores aren't, aren't adding up to what you need, you want them to. Um, but it could not be, I, I'm falling less and less out of the, it's the equipment. Equipment matters to a point. It really does. But ultimately it's just confidence and, and finding yourself on the right day. So. Yeah, I, I I I went to the range after the because here's the thing that's frustrating about the 79, I made the turn at even par, like so to shoot seven over on the back, frustrating, you know, and yeah, uh, and I, I it was because like I was making it work on the front, you know, you were making pots and you getting it, getting it on, chipping it close, make whatever, doing whatever you had to do. 
I took my old set, my my rocket blades, out to the range afterwards, and I just compared. I was bringing six iron of the Hogan, six iron of the rocket blades, just comparing and contrasting. They're obviously different clubs. One's a little bit more of a game improvement, but one's also seven years old. Um, and I'm like, I'm hitting the rocket blades higher, straighter. Uh, I'm hitting at distances the same. They're pretty comparable. Uh, one has a different feel than the other. Uh, different shafts, not by much, though. Same stiff shafts. They're KBS. One, I think, is a 90. One's an 85. Um, and I'm just trying to, like, figure out, like, what's the difference? How do I make this work? And, like, I don't know what to play on Saturday, to be honest. Like, I don't know what, what to bring on Saturday when we play. I feel like I got to break out the old set and go with that because I feel more comfortable. But I don't know. Like, I'm in this just weird quandary where I just I, – I'm I, – it's not confidence in my golf swing. It's just, is the ball going to go where I want it to go and where I'm aiming? I just want it to go where I'm aiming, and that's the problem. Well, you might have a good example on Saturday because I think I've told you this, but my buddy Tony is a really, really good irons player, and you'll have to let me know um, in private quarters if, if you agree with that after the round. But I, I'll urge you to bring the Hogan clubs, and that's that's just because I haven't seen you play them, and I'd love to, you know, I'd love to see it and, and be able to give you my assessment from there. I mean, you may be just being too hard on yourself or it may just be the difference between the range and the golf course, because as we all know, it's, it's hard to bring your game from the range to the golf course because the lies aren't always perfect. Um, the conditions aren't always perfect. You don't always, you know, when you're on the course, you don't get a second shot at it on the range. You hit a bad one and then you're like, Oh, let me try that again. You had a perfect one and you're, and you're happy with it. Well, that would have been a bogey or a double bogey because you don't get a second shot from the fairway. So uh, I'd urge you to bring the Hogan's. I'm curious to see how you hit them. Uh, I, I, I tend to, to get a pretty good feel of the sound and the ball flight, and I hopefully I can give you some good advice. Maybe you got to take a hit with them too, since they're stiff shafts. They're right up your alley. I think you'd probably hit yeah. them better than me. You'll probably hit them and go, I don't know if there's anything wrong with that, but you have swing speed for days, and that's the maybe that's I got to swing them faster. Maybe that's the whole thing. I don't know. Well, there's that. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe we'll do a club switch. I'll play with your blades, and I'll fire 86 with those, and uh, you can uh, shoot 68 with the Hogan's, and we'll go from there. <laughs> All right, let's talk uh, this week the Palmetto Championship. This is actually where the uh, Canadian Open would be on the schedule. Uh, this is in the Canadian Open still not happening this year. Uh, the border is obviously still closed, so they are playing the very beautiful, well-received Congaree Golf Course uh, for the Palmetto Championship. Congaree, I've not seen on TV. Uh, I've only seen pictures. It uh, is always uh, in the in the top. 30, 40 in the United States as far as best golf clubs in the country. So I'm kind of excited to see what this looks like on TV. Uh, the field, not as exciting, though. But well, are you interested in – I'm interested just for the golf course. Yeah, I'm interested for the golf course. On a separate note, the Canadian government is killing its economy, which is a sad, sad deal for our northern neighbors. Yeah, the folks in Ontario um, need to be able to play golf. That's frustrating. That's very frustrating that folks in Ontario are not playing golf right now. Very top-heavy field. Um, you know, you you, you kind of get through the first couple guys, and, and you're thinking, oh, you know, you got Dustin Johnson, you got Brooks Koepka, Tyrrell Hatton, not bad. And then you get like six players down further, and you're at Alex Noren, Keith Mitchell, Lucas Glover. Lucas Glover. It's not great. Yeah, it drops but off the table pretty quickly. It sure does. I'm, I'm very interested to see Congaree. It's a Tom Fazio course. I, I don't know – where I read this, but it's either Tom Fazio's favorite course or it's his top ranked course, um, something of that nature. But it, it, from the pictures, it strikes me a little bit like Kiwa. Obviously, they're they're in close proximity to each other, and and they have some of the same, you know. And that that might just be South Carolina golf, you know, coast golf. But um, I would be very excited for it if we hadn't just been at Kiwa. But Congaree, you know. This course does strike me as as being more of a, a of a beautiful course to watch rather than built for the test, and and that'll show well on TV. So I'm excited for that. It, it all kind of comes down to the final, the scoring and what the players say about it, you know, as opposed to what I think watching on TV. Um, but yeah, it, and who knows? Is this going to be is is this going to be a tournament next year if we can go back to 
to uh, uh, Canada for the RBC Canadian Open. I, I, th- I think if they're going, if they, I think their RBC Canada setup is is too good. I think they want to go to Canada, and if they can, but kind of like concession, right? Like it's like, man, I'd love to find a way to play a WGC at concession consistently because I loved it, and or Congaree. I would love to see us mix in some more of these kinds of courses so that we can see how it plays. Now I understand like places like Bandon Dunes couldn't probably accommodate the the giant field and all the fans and stuff like that. But like a WGC or a limited field event, I'd love to see more of that. I really would. Uh, so let's see how it plays out. All right. So let's get to the picks. I got to tell you, last week I won a cool 40 bucks uh, playing Daily Fantasy. My best finish ever. I took I took like sixth overall or something like that. 40 bucks. Let's go. I'm off the I'm off the Schneid tie. That's two weeks in a row I've cashed. Very good. I I cashed in two weeks ago. Um, this week I had three players miss the cut, so I was out of the money. Tough scene. This week was tough for me. I was a little scared of this one because I don't love the field and I didn't have a great vibe. So, who's your first pick? I went with someone that I think is going to be trending in the right, already is trending in the right direction, and I don't think that stops here. Um, you know. You kind of need that top heavy guy that, you know, if, if the field's going to be top heavy, you have to have one of those top tier guys. I'm just not feeling Dustin Johnson. Neither I'm not I. feeling a Tyrrell Hatton. So I had to go with Brooks Kepka for 12,100. Yeah. Brooks. And the problem is it's not a major, so I'm not a hundred percent in on Brooks Kepka. And, um, that's the thing. Yeah. There's not a lot of form in the top of this field. Uh, so I, I kind of dodged those and I went with a guy who doesn't have form but like desperately needs form in the worst way as we get set for the U S open. A lot of European tour guys playing in this event this week because of the U S open being next week. They need that tune up. I'm taking Tommy Fleetwood, uh, for 11,500. He is really kind of dropped off the radar as far as like top golfers, kind of like what happened to Matsuyama where you're just like, he became kind of an also ran, Fleetwood's kind of in also ran territory. He needs to deliver at some point. And I'm going to bank that he, I'm going to hope that this is the week. Cause I like Tommy Fleetwood and I want him to be a good, I want him to win tournaments here in America. So we got to find it, Tommy. Let's get it going right now. Come on. I'm taking Tommy yeah, Fleetwood I, for 11,500. I used to think of Tommy Fleetwood as being a guy who played well at difficult golf courses. Um, and that's kind of changed a little bit. And, and, not necessarily because of his performance, but just the tournaments he's showing up to. And I don't know if it's a, a status issue or what it is exactly with Tommy Fleetwood, but he's got a little bit left to prove. So, yeah, why not this week? I need I need Tommy to play well. This is a prove-it week for Fleetwood. If he can get some momentum heading into Torrey, now all of a sudden he becomes sort of a name you think about because he's played well at U.S. Opens. So if he can get on a little groove heading into that, I'd, I'd definitely like, my, I'd like him a lot better in that situation. All right, number yep. two. Number two, so uh, this could be for pictures, but it looks like a very green golf course. Green means water. Water means soft. Uh, there's also a little bit of target golf in, in this golf course, similar to Kiowa. I went with Kevin Kisner for 9800 bucks. I just think he has the ability to keep the ball in play. And jeepers, he's he's a top 12 money guy here for, for daily fantasy, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, he's a great putter. Obviously, he's from the South, the South Carolina thing, like I think – but I don't th- – yeah, this course doesn't strike me as a Kevin Kisner course because, uh, I mean, it, it does feel very it, – it does feel like you're going to need to hit hit the ball far and 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 there is a lot of sand and I don't – yeah, I don't know. I, but you never know, right? And Kiz just hasn't played great. I don't think he's played – he hasn't – he's another guy that's just sort of disappeared here uh, in this era of hit the ball very far. He just doesn't do that. And he's not making nope. enough putts. But – he needs a big week. Say it as this guy. I'm taking my second guy, Patton Kazire. Uh, once again, long. I want to. I'm not a big Patton Kazire guy. Let's just be clear. But I'm going to take guys that hit it far. I'm going to take guys that can kind of bludgeon a golf course with irons. I think Kazire can do that, and he's starting to play pretty decent. So he's had a couple of pretty solid weeks in recent weeks. So I'm going to take that and hope that that's enough to get things done. Uh, not great at the Memorial, but before that, he was pretty good at the Charles Schwab and pretty good at the Byron. And uh, and not terrible at the Wells Fargo. So he's starting to play some decent golf. Not great last week. We'll see about this week. You went with the other kids. Uh, I, I stuck along the same path, and I took for $10,400 the long bomber, Patton Kazire. 
You took Kazire at three. Okay, I like that. All right, we're. I like when we. I like when we're simpatico, Ty. I like when we see the yep. same things. My yep. third pick, I went off the radar, only because he plays in Europe, but he might be one of the five hottest golfers in the world right now. I'm taking Garrick Higo. Garrick Higo, who won twice in a row. Uh, on the European tour like three or four weeks ago. He got on a little bit of a run. He's He made the cut at the PGA, his first real taste here in American golf. So he played Kiowa pretty well. Um, I think he's playing well. He's a lefty. He's got a very interesting game. Uh, I've only had a chance to watch him like once on Golf Channel in one of the weeks he won, and I watched him a little bit in the PGA Championship. I don't know. I kind of dig him. I kind of dig his game, and I want to see more. So I'm going to root for Garrick Higo to have a big week. Yeah, I watched the same European Tour tournament that you're talking about that he won, and and it was Sunday, and he was he was they showed him a lot. So yeah, Gary Kigo, not to be confused with, confused with Harry Higgs. Um, yep, lefty, and uh, why not? Boy, Harry Higgs fired an 82 on Sunday at the uh, PGA or at the uh, Memorial. That's a tough uh, tough scene. Yeah, that's not great. And I love Harry Higgs, but that 82 was. Whew. Maybe yeah. not quite aspirational. Let's just say that. I wouldn't say that was great. All right. Uh, number uh, four for you. You're not going to like – if you didn't like Kevin Kisner, you're not going to like this pick. But you know what? It's my team, and I chose him, and I went with Harold Varner the third. HV3. $9,700. You know HV3. what? He's another guy that you know you like. Like, I like Harold. He's easy to root for. You want him to do well. I love the fact that Jordan sponsors him. I want more guys wearing Jumpman golf stuff. I think that's sweet. I got to see him win something. Like, I, he's got to he's got to get in the mix a little more often. Uh, he's got plenty of bat speed. Like, he swings fast. Uh, I, I want to see him. I got. I want to see him put it together for four rounds. That's. I'm. I. I'm. I'm not rooting against Harold Varner the third. I want it to happen. I just am waiting for it to happen. It hasn't happened yet. All right, the last time we saw him, he was destroying uh, property at the PGA Championship. But he's the pride of the University of Minnesota. I'm taking Eric Van Royen. Eric Van Royen to uh, get himself uh, going in the right direction. Clearly not the PGA Championship he was looking for. He got headlines where he didn't want it. I wonder if some vindication is on his mind this week. And he just destroyed the U.S. Open qualifier finished in first place in his at his site. Um, I was I, I I tracked a lot of the U.S. Open qualifying sites, and I'm surprised that so many guys stuck around in in Ohio for those qualifiers oh, that's because a that was a tough. One, yeah. I mean, you ha- I mean you had to shoot ten under over the two days to qualify, and at, at the site that that Ricky Fowler went to. Other sites, I mean, there were less spots, but you could have qualified at four under for the combined for the two days. I, I just think I thought guys would spread out a little bit more, and they didn't. Um, but yeah, Eric Van Royen, I think, shot fourteen under for the two days and and destroyed the field. So he will be at the U.S. Open. Um, so this is a little bit of a, but he's probably going to be showing up late, um, not getting the practice rounds. So we'll see. And, and hey, quick aside. Uh, what did you make of the Ricky? Fa- well, Ricky misses the cut barely. Like he played pretty, but he played starting to play decent golf. Prescription sunglasses. He said he couldn't see things from 150 yards away. Yep. Interesting. I read. I read the same thing. So <laughs> we'll see. You'd think that would be an obvious um, thing to address, but if if that's what what it takes, then then so be it. I'm, should, I'm all for it. I'm should a, the USGA, as you know, a big Ricky Fowler guy. Now that Phil qualified on his own merits, should the USGA give that special exemption they were going to give the Phil to Ricky or no? I mean, I, as a fan of Ricky Fowler, I'd love to see it, but Ricky Fowler kind of, I mean, they asked him about the qualifying and he said, if I make it, I make it. If I don't, it's not the end of the world. So I don't know if I'd, if I would extend it if he's talking like that but it would be good for golf kind of agree he draws eyes that's true your fifth guy so we'll see if uh we'll play a little bit of uh trivia here i uh have two people on my my team who wear jordans can you guess the second one for nine thousand dollars keegan bradley no whoa pat perez pat perez pat perez (laughs) <laughs> he's scuffling a little bit though this year, isn't he? I mean, yeah, he's... he is. He makes about half the cuts he plays, but um, 
I don't know. It, it, it was a good deal, and I like Pat Perez. I, I want him to do well. Me too. Um, I, I don't think he needs to do well. Um, in general, I think he's, he's got his stuff kind of figured out, and he knows who he is. But I like Pat Perez. I'm going to take, uh, for my fifth pick, not bad, by the way, my fifth pick, I'm going to take a guy who's been kind of a, a little bit, he sort of rectified himself a little bit. He has steadied the ship after he just disappeared for a while. I'm taking Lucas Glover. Uh, Lucas Glover won the U.S. Open back in 2010 uh, and then just fell off a cliff for a while. Like, it got really bad for him for a little while. He couldn't do anything right. But when he's on, he's always been considered one of the best iron players on the tour. And he's starting to play a little steadier. He's not back to contending every week status yet. But he's made 15 of 21 cuts. He's playing a lot. And he's 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 cashing checks. So I feel good about Lucas Glover for 9900 yeah, it's a little rich for my blood, but yeah, certainly has played pretty well, and the result, you know, the proof is in the pudding. He's he's played well. I, I don't hate that pick at all. Last pick for you. I went with a guy that I've picked a few times this year, and he always disappoints me when I do, and when I don't, <laughs> he shows me up. I went with Richie Wierenski for eighty seven hundred bucks. It was it was bleak. I didn't have a lot of money, but in terms of this tournament, he's about halfway through the field, so not too bad. Richie is, uh, yeah, he's feast or famine, isn't he? Like he's, it seems like he's in the top five or he misses the cut. Like those are his choices. You don't, and hopefully this is a top five week for you because then you'll be doing quite well. Yep. My last guy, eight thousand eight hundred. I'm going to take Sepp Straka. Uh, Sepp again usually teases the first round leaderboard and then never really contends. But if he can make the cut, I'd be all about that. The, just make the cut, play the weekend. And we'll be just fine, Sepp Straka. So I'm going to go with that. So I'm taking kind of a, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm taking some gambles this week. I'm going with some guys I don't normally go with, but we're going to see what that translates to when we get to it. Me as well. Yep. All right, man. Hey, we did a good job this week. We've got we've got golf to play this weekend. I'm so excited about that. We are going to come back here next week and break that whole thing down. Uh, that will be an outrageous experience. Got to stay tuned for that. We will preview the U.S. Open at Torrey Pines. And then, of course, next Sunday night, you and I will be here after it's all done, and we'll chat about the winner and our, get our immediate reaction to the uh, to the U.S. Open. So it should be fantastic. So it's going to be a crazy week of golf. Enjoy Congaree. Uh, the ladies are playing Lake Merced at the Meta Heel. Uh, Lake Merced is the third of that triumvirate of Olympic Club, Harding Park, and Lake Merced. So they're basically hanging out there again, playing a similar golf course to Olympic. Uh, that's going to make for more primetime golf, so enjoy the hell out of that. That's going to be great. Uh, I know I'm going to be watching that as well. So enjoy the golf. Ty and I are going to stay cool, but we're going to get out there and get after it this weekend. We can't wait. Updates also on the iron testing as we go forward. You're right, Ty. All right, I'll play the Hogans this Saturday with you. I hope we're on the same team. Are we on the same team, or are we going to be on opposite teams? I think we better be on the same team. We can figure that out. Yeah, okay. So if we're on the same team and I know you got me, then I'll, I'll play the Hogans and hopefully you can help me out. All right, Sounds bud. Uh, once again, thanks for listening in. Find us on your podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get those podcasts. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to like us, share us. Uh, send us out. Tell somebody you know. Do all of that good stuff for us. I appreciate it. You can find us Facebook.com slash Tim Podcast. Uh, and like us there and follow us there for all of the latest updates on the podcast and everything else that we're doing and all of that. You can email me too. Uh, find me on Twitter, Tim Anderson Pod, uh, Mr. Tim Anderson on Instagram, and also uh, email us at timpodcast1 at yahoo.com. I can't think of any more ways for you to communicate with the show, so do it. Uh, but on behalf of everybody else, thanks to Ty. We will see you next time. Keep your head up. Enjoy yourself. Stay cool, and we'll see you next week.